Um, so yeah, uh, I will talk to you and also exchange with you about um, cosmograms. I still have to adapt a little bit to this strange microphone in front of my mouth, but I guess it will work out well. <laughs> um, so uh, let me start by saying that um, who, uh, to explain a little bit who I am. Uh, so I am an uh, uh, artist, dramaturg, researcher. I work in the field of, of the performing arts and um, I teach and do research at KASK School of Arts. It's an it's a institution in Ghent. And uh, since a year or so, I've been doing uh, this research about cosmograms uh, focused on what you could say connective storytelling. Um, and um, this uh, this research has been going on for quite a while uh, now, since since a few years. But let's say it has taken more uh, concrete and institutional forms um, since a year. Um, the I wanted to start with a beautiful quote, which is, I hope I didn't butcher it, or deepl.com didn't butcher it, but uh, it's a translation of a Dutch uh, version of a quote by Lucretius, De Rerum Natura. Um, I'll maybe give you just a little bit of time to read it by yourself. Okay. Um, you could say that de rerum natura. Um, I see Francis uh, watching with with your fronts to ogen. Do I have to read it myself? No. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so uh, you could say that de rerum natura is a cosmogram in itself. Um, I will uh, explain immediately what a cosmogram exactly is, um, but it. Uh, um, it is, uh, yeah, I will, I will do that later. But um, let's say how uh, the research is um, is located within a broader field of practices. Um, uh, next to being an artist, I've also been very active as an activist in the last five years uh, as as an environmental activist, and and um, I think that this uh, these questions are very much related to um, to to what has been going on environmentally uh, speaking. Um, I am not the only one, of course, who, as an artist, um, tries to think aesthetic forms uh, differently uh, with um, in a changed environment. Uh, what some call uh, a cosmographic or a cosmological revolution. Um, so there's a lot of people in the performing arts, in the visual arts, uh, in literature, etc., 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 who um, who try to redefine their mediums. Um, and uh, I try to uh, do that a little bit within the field of storytelling, and so I'm I'm um, uh, inspired by many many artists and many uh, thinkers, um, and um, and one of those is Frederic Aituati. Uh, she's um, a scholar who has worked a lot with Bruno Latour, um, and she is the one who's uh, who kind of. Um, yeah, worked on the theatrical translations of a lot of his thinking. So for the, those of you, you who know, he also did quite some lecture performances and theatrical uh, experiments, and she was the one who who, uh, who was working with him uh, on that. And um, and so I'll read you uh, this quote uh, because it's um, yeah uh, quite important when it comes to this uh, to this question of yeah how to adapt these forms in times of cosmological revolution. So here we go. In the 17th century, in particular, astronomy relied on literature, its powers of figuration, narration, and speculation to make the cosmological transformation of the Copernican revolution thinkable and representable, to turn the Earth from a fixed place it has been for centuries into a planet, a star wandering among the stars. And so today, the place and situation of the Earth uh, the place, nature, and situation of the Earth are once again under debate. The sciences of the Earth system are examining the profound interactions between the living and the fab fabric of the Earth. Contemporary biology is overturning our representations of the boundaries between the animate and the inanimate, and the ecological crisis is profoundly transforming our conception of the Earth's limits and its resources. 
and here uh, yeah, is the link with the arts. The arts from literature to the visual arts, from cinema to theater, are once again being mobilized to capture this new cosmological revolution. So um, actually what she has been working on a lot, um, and Latour as well, is also about how uh, the arts and science um, collaborated um, and, uh, and indeed, uh, as this quote is uh, mentioning, made uh, things visual, thinkable, visible, thinkable, uh, um, etc. And um, and so uh, so they have been doing that work uh, to a certain extent in the field of of, uh, of the performing arts. Um, I personally have worked as a dramaturg with a young artist called Bosse Prevost, who uh, made um, theater pieces as you could say moving ecosystems. Um, so where the scenography um, was uh, was also very much alive. Uh, it's a it's a metaphor that Bruno Latour himself actually uses a lot. Uh, the, the the decor, the scenography of a theater, and how um, uh, in let's say normal theater pieces, uh, this was the kind of inanimate background for interactions between human beings. They were they fell in love, they murdered each other, they were angry at each other, etc. Um, but uh, but what happens if this background becomes alive and and plays a role as well? Um, so uh, maybe uh, we can also go to a quote by Latour himself, which could also like open up this imagination. And before I go on, uh, you can always interrupt me. Yes, already. Thank you. It's a biased uh, comment, uh, comment, but because I work in astrobiology too, and I yes. think the cosmological revolution today is takes part with astrobiology, so the search for life elsewhere in on Earth, and it's also another decentration of humankind from being as a, the only life in the universe to possibly being amongst uh, one kind of life amongst many in the galaxy or in the universe. So uh, I think it's more than just uh, another view of the Earth, looking at the Earth itself, but l looking also at all the exoplanets we are finding. And... Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, well, actually, the, the next quote is, is perfect for that uh, very, very uh, large view you're taking here. It's, um, it's the two uh, people who are... Um, Kind of who are seen as the founders of the Gaia theory, uh, which I guess uh, is not so unfamiliar to most of you here in this room. Um, and uh, you could say that one of them deals with the very, very small, and the other deals with the very, very, very big. Um, and um, and so I will read you the quote. And so Gaia stories between Lovelock and Margulis. What could be Gaia stories? It's also a, a question that Latour himself uh, literally posed. So. Um, the originality of Gaia is that this new earth that moves, that propels itself, is not the cosmos, it is not nature, but living beings transforming themselves to give other living beings the conditions of habitability that allow them to survive. Lovelock sees it from above, from the atmosphere, and Lynn Margulis sees it from below, from the smallest and the oldest. What neither biologists interested in organisms nor geologists interested in geophysics understand, these two, Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, will understand precisely, because one is interested in the overall result, in what living beings have done to transform the world, and the other in the origin of the beings that give Gaia its consistency and its composition. So for those of you um, who, who who are not familiar with uh, with with those two uh, persons, those those two very important uh, sci scientific uh, thinkers. Um, so James Lovelock uh, came from um, space exploration. He was an inventor, um, and and uh, and so also uh, was an Earth system thinker, you could say. Um, and uh, and Lynn Margulis was a biologist, so dealing with the smallest uh, uh, particles and 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 how life is constituted and uh, and. Um, and uh, her main uh, topic, you could say, was symbiosis, and and so how uh, different organisms um, uh, interact and and um, and depend on each other, and um, and also, of course, uh, are in conflict with each other. Um, so, 
I think these two figures and these two perspectives, the very, very small and the very, very big, and I'm, I'm happy to that you also and enter, this was not part of my imagination, but indeed the, the outside world is, is highly likely also not uh, inanimate. Uh, there's, there's probably also, it would be very uh, strange if we would be the only ones uh, in the universe. Um, but, um, but so these two perspectives, I think are very important when it comes to um, constructing new kinds of stories and constructing Gaia stories. It's it's not only uh, dealing with the you could say the mesocosm of human interactions, but also this macro and this this um, this uh, microcosms, and uh, and how these uh, these kind of interact. Um, another uh, inspiring um, uh, thinker, writer, artist um, that you also may know. She's very popular uh, since she died. Um, and uh, more and more, um, and she's um, Ursula K. Le Guin is a science fiction uh, writer um, who wrote the most amazing uh, novels. Uh, so it's a feminist science fiction. It's very far from uh, the, 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 the 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 your usual Hollywood science fiction. It's um, um, and and well, this quote is is um, is maybe illustrative of how her uh, science fiction is different and her fantasy because she also wrote fantasy novels with magicians and everything you can imagine uh, that is connected to fantasy. Um, but it is um, uh, her stories uh, function very differently, and so she wrote a beautiful text that I invite you to 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 read. It's a it's a very short text, the Carrier Bacteria Fiction. I read it uh, each year with my students, and so this is, a, this is a small quote. It is hard to tell a really gripping tale of how I wrested a wild oat seed from its husk, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. And then I scratched my gnat bites, and Ool said something funny, and we went to the creek and got a drink and watched newts for a while, and then I found another patch of oats. No, it doesn't compare. It cannot compete with how I thrust my spear deep into the titanic hairy flank white oop, impaled on one huge sweeping tusk, writhed screaming and blood spouted everywhere in crimson torrents. And Boob was crushed to jelly when the mammoth fell on him as I shot my unerring arrow straight through eye to brain. It's... um. So in the text, she is contrasting two kinds of storytelling, um, and um, and the one that has been uh, the dominant one, uh, she uses the, the the this imagery of of uh, the spear uh, as 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 a also as a metaphor for it's not only because conflict uh, was the most important element of these stories that she's trying to find an alternative for, also. Uh, uh, the hero was very often the, the 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 element in the story that kind of was the most active, and there were a lot of uh, very passive elements uh, around this hero. Um, but also, uh, it talks about how a story, how the the structure of a story unfolds. So, um, how a story is uh, is going from A to Z, from from a beginning um, to a very clear uh, goal uh, at the end of the story, and so. The stories she is writing um, are are more meandering. Conflict is a part of those stories, but not the only, uh, not not the overall structure is 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 conflict based. Um, there's um, the, the the heroes. If there are heroes in the story, they they look a little bit ridiculous, uh, you could say, or they are they are very much criticized. Um, and I think uh, that that um, well, her her stories. Or, or her her ideas about storytelling are inspiring for for stories in the sense of novels or short stories etc but of course also on a deeper level um the stories we tell about natural history the stories uh, the historical stories we tell as well um i think um maybe some of you have read the dawn of everything which is also a very different kind of uh history writing uh, than the your usual progress Going from the hunter gatherers, uh, and there's the agricultural revolution, the industrialization, etc. And we go to to the present. Uh, it is, of course, uh, the, the real story is a different one, a more complicated one, and a much more interesting, uh, in her view and in mine as well. Um, 
uh, yeah. So maybe it's time to talk about cosmograms themselves. So, um, so I've I've given you a little bit of a um, references about uh, about storytelling, but cosmograms actually are, um, are exist in different forms. So they are, um, um, there are. I will go to the quote of um, of John Tresh, who was the one who coined the term. Um, and uh, that's, well, I got to know it via Latour, uh, who, who references the term a lot, and, um, and uh, Aituati as well. And uh, so this is the very short description. So cosmograms are representations of the universe, objects that convey what the cosmos contains, interrelated in hierarchies, its history and direction, and humans' place within it. There are different kinds of cosmograms. There are scientific ones. Um, you could say there's scientific diagrams that uh, that are representations of a specific kind of universe or a specific kind of world. There are, of course, scientific ones. Um, this one uh, you probably recognize, uh, the structure of, uh, of the Dante uh, universe um, in La Divina Commedia. Um, but there are also... Um, at my paper there are also sp spiritual cosmograms uh and so on and also the objects that uh, john trash is talking about can take very different shapes so there are architectural cosmograms there are um there are iconographic ones there are performative ones and so there are also narrative cosmograms and so that's the one i am focusing on in my in my research um so how this um how i see this talk evolving uh um, in the near future in the coming hour or so it i would like to uh give you some um references of um of more recent narrative cosmograms uh that are very inspiring to me and i hope i'll be able to kind of translate that to you um and uh, and then I'll I'll go into um, so for Orion who's in the in the Zoom room it will be a bit of a repetition but I'll also go into um, a story that I've written myself and uh, and what were the kind of compositional problems I encountered along the way um, that could maybe be inspiring or I don't know maybe some of you are busy with cosmograms yourself in in different kinds of objects and in different fields um, but so first. Uh, an example is a, a, a famous poet who's not very well known in in our in our uh, regions. Uh, but so the artist that I talked about before that I worked with uh, as a dramaturg, Bosse Prevost, um, we made that was um, that was very much inspired and that also used uh, a text of this um, long epic poem, "It" by Inger Christensen. Um, she's a Danish poet. And um, and so um, I wanted to show you the um, like the content uh, the uh, how do you say the con page of content um, of the book. So to give you an impression of how this cosmogram is structured. Um, so Inge Christensen was someone who was very much inspired by mathematics, and um, and so a lot of um, the the kind of compositions she made in her poetry were uh, were had numerical inspirations or uh, for example um this uh, this poem starts uh, so the prologos which is uh, quite amazing i to me the, the the best part of the book uh, so the first part it starts with um a very uh long uh chunk of text and it's uh, diminishes in um, in, uh, in, in the, the different chunks are smaller and smaller and smaller, um, and she uses the the golden the golden sneed. How do you say that uh, in English? The golden the golden section. So she uses the golden section to to make the the composition of this first part uh, prologos. And um, and so yeah, as you see, uh, the, the 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 subtitles um, are quite abstract, um, and uh, so symmetries, transit, transitivities, continuities, etc. 
And then there's also uh, the overall metaphor of the theater. Um, so the stage, there's action and there's text. And it ends with an epilogos. And um, just to give you a slight feel of how the, the, the this prose poem um, works is um, I can just read a, a little bit. I hope I do it justice. It, that's it. That started it. It is, goes on, moves beyond, becomes, becomes it and it and it, goes further than that, becomes something else, becomes more, combines something else with more to keep becoming something else and more, goes further than that, becomes something besides something else and more, something, something new, newer still. In the new now, in the next now, becomes as new as it now can be, imposes itself, flaunts itself, touches, is touched, catches free material, grows bigger and bigger, builds itself up by being more than itself, gains weight, gains speed, gains more in its rush, gains on something else, passes something else, which is taken up, taken in, fast laden with what came first so randomly begun that's it and so this goes on for a for a long time um but the 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 so as i hope uh was apparent from how i said it a little bit uh is is that there's a kind of a rhythm to the to the to the to the whole thing which of course also reflects kind of the, we are very cosmic in very cosmic realms here um with this first part but throughout this prologos the, the, the what she describes becomes less abstract and all of a sudden a house appears a human being animals etc so it becomes more and more defined um what is uh, talked about um in in the prologos so um i'll maybe stop here uh, if there's any questions or remarks Please interrupt. Otherwise, I'll go on to the to the second. Um, yes, maybe the you can use the mic. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more the general structure of the book. I see stage, action, text, and then the same categories. So, how how, how is the book structured? Yeah, it is a very complex structure, and I must be honest that I haven't reread it recently. Um, but um but what i can say is that indeed there's there's um so for example these symmetries these transitivities so there there are within the overall compositional structure there are compositional methods that reappear and uh, but always under different guises because of course stage is different than action but so the symmetries you 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 will see um similar uh, operations compositional operations that work in those different chapters but then yeah in, in different contexts it's um it's difficult to explain without without the actual the actual um book at hand which i didn't take um but um hmm, there's something else um There's also, a, a compositionally speaking, um, for example, what I just read has all these short bits. So there's also a variation uh, in those um, in, in 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 the length of um, of sentences. So which which of course generates different kinds of rhythms uh, in the book, and um, uh, and indeed the reappearance of elements. Uh, so also the elements that she, she writes about, but in then different contexts. Um, yeah, that's a little bit what I can say right now. Uh, but so the um, so yeah the the um, so there's always so the, the the length of the of the first part. Um, then the the second part is is shorter, and then the third part is shorter. But then the um, it's also wachte. Wait, how how do you say it? Wachte. So you have, for example, let's say this 
first part has three pages, full without any alineas in between. Then you have a, a second bit of the of the prologos, which is cut in two. And uh, and so it has the the same length, but but the different chunks are cut in two. Then you actually go to the next part, which is cut in three, and then uh, and so it goes on. Um, but uh, yeah, I also cannot explain it better than that. The point, I think, uh, I don't know if you you know the work of uh, Andresa de Keersmaker, uh, the 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 dent. Yes, so. I think there's a similar um, belief or a similar interest behind that. That there's a there's kind of an the suggestion of an order be, behind uh, behind things, and um, and so her uh, her way of expressing that is using these mathematical uh, mathematical structures um, behind uh, yeah in in her in her poetry. Yes, you you keep on frowning. Uh, no. Well, the point. I don't know if there's a point to to a to a poetic. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's um. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think that's what I could say about it. It's it's a. Uh, I think what is also interesting me in in compositional um, methods and and also here is this uh, this difference between chaos and cosmos, where where you have a, a, a very how do you say a random collection of elements and where they all of a sudden kind of cohere and become a cosmos, become something that uh, that interrelates and connects. And I think the way how she connects uh, elements. Is uh is indeed yeah mathematically inspired. It's not my uh, kind of inspiration, but it's uh it's it's what she is using. Yeah. Uh, so, well, maybe it will come back. Who knows? Um, so a second uh, um, reference I wanted to share is from Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, who actually in her in her text um, uh, that I just read a. Uh, 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 fragment from so the carrier bacteria fiction uh describes a, a, a story that um in many of her books you feel elements specific elements of of um of that uh that vision but very often they they still have a, a kind of a more or less um uh classic uh, structure this book is completely different always coming home is is one of her less famous uh novels um and uh and the structure is uh is not uh, it's not usual novel so it's it's not a, a story like most of her books uh, that really go from a to z um even though uh they find they, they they well conflict is not uh, the, the main element and uh, and heroes are 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 are, are ridiculized uh, let's say um, this one is a collection of um, of short stories, um, fictional uh, anthropological studies. Uh, there's a, there's there are songs. Um, there's a, as you can see here in the in the content table. There are there's a codex. There are uh, there's also an explanation about how the family system works. So it is um, it is a story about uh, a community, uh, a people. Um, set in a in a fictional uh, time and space, is not super clear if we are talking uh, we're uh, if we are in the future or somewhere in the past. So in that sense, it's 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 it doesn't have like that fantasy clear fantasy feel or clear science fiction feel that her other books have. Um, but uh, but it is um, it's not a story of of, of a limited group of characters it is a story of a community and also how this community is functioning uh, so uh, so you have for example an uh, so uh, an explanation of how the family system works uh, which is more of a system of kind of kinship uh, you have a, an explanation of what their um, relation to to religion is um, and so 
the the book is not is also like Rayuela, uh, which some of you may know uh, from uh, from Cortazar. Um, it's a book that you can read. You don't have to read from the first page to the last one. You can also flip through the book uh, in different ways. Um, and uh, the the reading experience is quite um, uh, addictive uh, because with each element or each story or poem or song, etc., you read. There's always a moment that you wonder, like, ah, this I don't really get, or I don't understand this word. And then not understanding this word makes you go to the back of the book, which is at the end of this this second page here, uh, where a little bit more explanation about how the um, the um, the community works. And there's also an uh, um, here somewhere uh, there's a glossary, so where also a lot of words are explained. And so then you go to the glossary, you read about this, and then this makes you wonder uh, about a certain story that you that. You you would connect the title to uh, to the word you just um, uh, discovered the meaning of, and so this is a bit how this book uh, is working um, as a as a as a interlinked web of of information about this fictional uh, community, um, and uh, what else uh, to say? So yeah, here you can see it. So there's a well how playing is dealt with in this community how which medical practices are used. Uh, there's, of course, th there's also an, um, a ritualistic uh, element to the to the community. It is, um, well, I read it with students last year and um, uh, in the, um, uh, well, with, with our eyes, with the eyes of 2023, you could say, okay, a part of this is a cultural appropriation. Um, a part of this is, is um, is uh, referencing to uh, Native American uh, cultures. Um, and I don't know, I think even that Ursula K. Le Guin has a drop of blood uh, link that l would link her to the Native Americans. But that is, of course, a very American uh, uh, debate. But it's it's also uh, a debate that is held here, uh, well, uh, with, that I have with my students. Um, so there was also some criticality to this work. But nevertheless, um there's a uh, the 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 structure of the book is um is i think highly inspiring if we want to think um storytelling in in a, in another way and and as i said in the beginning maybe a more adapted uh, way uh, to to nowadays um uh environmental um mutation so uh this is uh Ursula K. Le Guin. And then uh, I would like to conclude my list of um, of uh, references with um, with a very very strange book. Uh, it's a beautiful book by Ben Marcus. Yes, and um, Ben Marcus is a is an American writer, a very experimental uh, writer who um, wrote uh, a book that's this is his debut uh, novel. Uh, which is called the Age of Wire and String, and um, it is a uh, um, well, not a, not a, a usual story either. It is a collection of um, it's it's it has more of a catalog. The 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 structure is catalog like you could say. Um, so there's uh, big uh, chapters um, like sleep, God around huge topics. Uh, food, the house, animal, weather, persons, society, and so all together they also um, the book uh, depicts a whole universe, um, a whole um, a, a world that functions very differently than our world. Um, it is um, it is a, a a world that different than than uh, Le Guin which uses different words and words that we don't know that she gives different meanings to here most of the words used all of the words used actually are words that that we know but how they interconnect uh, are uh, they interconnect in in, uh, in very different ways so there there's a, it's a very um a little bit of a brain breaker this book because you cannot really grasp exactly what is talked about but you feel uh, that there is a coherence that that there is something elements that reappear 
um, and uh, and it's not we're not in total chaos. It, this is not like a random random collection of elements, but there is something that makes sense. But it's kind of outside uh, outside of our uh, cerebral rational grasp. Um, maybe to give you a small example, uh, of, maybe it's not bad to also go just to the to some of the um, subtitles. Um, yeah, so I'll just read the house ones and the golden Monica, the enemy in house culture, works from the war between houses and wind, exporting the inner man, views from the first house, and every chapter ends with terms. So, um, you could say that these uh, different uh, subtitles they. These are the titles of, of stories, but, well, I don't know if you could call them stories. It's more descriptions, very strange descriptions, and then which, uh, well, explain, explanatory glossary, but they, they, they uh, generate more confusion than really uh, clarity. Um, and to give you a small example of the kind of prose that Ben Marcus uh, is using in this book, uh, which... Well, his other books are, are also really beautiful. I uh, can really advise them to read. Um, but uh, but I think prose-wise, this is the strangest. This goes the furthest away from, from uh, say common sense. Um, so I wanted to read you the, the part on the mother. Mother, the, the softest location, the softest location in the house. It's smells of foods that are fine and sweet. Often it moves through rooms on its own, cooing the name of the person. When it is tired, it sits, and members vie for position in its arms. Well, this is maybe still graspable somehow. Um, so I'll read the next one as well. Private house law. Rule of posture for house inhabitants stating the desired position in relation to the father. Bend forward, bring food, sharpen the pencil. Never stand above nor shed the harness or grip the tunic tightly when it is present. Its clothes must be combed with the fingers, its speech written down, its commands followed, its spit never under any circumstances to be wiped away from the, from the face. Shelter the shel no, shelter witnesses, members which have viewed the destruction, duplication, or creation of shelters. They are required to sign or carve their names or emblems in, onto the house in question and are subject to a separate vigilant census. Um, so yeah, to give you a small uh, impression of the kind of book this is, um, most of uh, the, so there are some concrete locations in the book um for example ohio is the is the um, is the place that is mentioned the most in the book so i don't have any reference to ohio but uh, so yeah um just for those who have it's maybe interesting um so these are a few uh, a few examples um of uh, more recent cosmograms um yeah okay any questions in the meantime or remarks or or other interesting references that you could give me that you think oh this is a maybe an interesting cosmogram to research for you well one remark uh, i quite like that actually it's pretty funny and witty i think to read but uh it still begs the question in essence, does a book like that differ from the telephone book or from an encyclopedia uh, in terms of what a cosmogram is? Is the telephone book a cosmogram in your view? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it is indeed also uh, um, and, and, uh, and the encyclopedia as well. Um, so it, it it is a representation of a of a of a whole of a of a, a kind of universe, and that yeah, a telephone book as well. Of course, it it's it uh, it gives you all the telephone numbers of a specific city, um, 
and so also all the the different kinds of people the different names um of the people living in that city so there's there's i think it's a it's a beautiful kind of cosmogram but of course the difference with this one uh well a telephone book is not an artistic uh, cosmogram it's not a it's it's not um a cosmogram with uh, with artistic intentions it also um tries to be structured in a way that is very easily usable very communicative very clear um and of course artistic cosmograms don't have those um those ambitions i think maybe a scientific ones as well yeah, it's also about making something as clear as possible it's also about being fact based being etc but yeah um and so what uh, how how i encountered this book um was through a text i read on speculative fiction um, and so you could say that the cosmogram, which is of course very different than a telephone book, this cosmogram has speculative um, intentions or motivations. And for me, it was very interesting to read this book because your usual speculative literature um, brings you to fantasy novels or science fiction novels uh, first and foremost. So this was speculation, at least how it was explained in this in this essay that I read uh, about it. This would speculation on a on a on the level of gra grammatics, gra grammatic, grammar, grammar, um, more than on the level of of, uh, of fiction. So it's not I'm not speculating about, or this book is not speculating about how the world could look like in thirty years, and uh, what the relations between uh, what 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 gender relations would be at that moment in time, how technology would have evolved, etc. This is actually stays very everyday life for every. The, the, it's very simple. The the there's the mother, the father, the table, the house, etc., etc., etc. But it's about the speculative uh, element. Is is indeed how sentences are constructed, how um, uh, um, substantive and uh, how how um, nouns um, have have um, are differently uh, used. Um, how um, yeah how how uh, uh it's it's a it's a disruption a disruption of of uh, of of logical um connections that are made between uh uh yeah linguistic elements you could say and and so i found that a very inspiring um it's it's something that i think you know that that i experience as a reader uh very often in in poetry um where indeed uh, it's sometimes very difficult to grasp how how uh, the elements are exactly connected and, and it generates a, a kind of uh, imagination that is very different than the imagination generated by a fictional novel or, or by a movie or by it is um it is more more abstract um and uh more more yeah sometimes difficult to pierce through uh but this was a uh, uh, yeah a kind of reader's experience I have with poetry, but then with uh, with with a in a more narrative form. Uh, and 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 uh, well, this is called a novel, but I don't think you can call this a novel. But um, yeah. So if if I yes. can comment on the on the uh, uh, phone book uh, and encyclopedias, I I think there there's probably a difference in in a definition of of a cosmogram mm -hmm. versus any representation or story. Not that any representation or story doesn't like propose a worldview and doesn't structure the, this view by kind of reflecting it in its own structure. Yeah? So for example, the 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 phone book would then reality as composers kind of equal equal, uh, equal equivalent units being humans with phones yes, and we, without for example reflecting in the size of what they will like how much space they'll take on the page or something like that yes but but some stories are like this there was once you know a boy in a village yes and it's not a cosmogram in a sense that they immediately locate and zoom in and say i will i will I will speak about something particular, yes? And if I understand you correctly, the cosmogram type of uh, representation would be, okay, reality.
is like that yes so it's kind of like a like a large scale and of course you know it's an artistic thing so so if if you take the mind this is basically the the yeah this is reality and all the like you know like even uh, theoretically bigger things are fit into your home and and your family relations and, and so on mm -hmm. but but the framing yes or the intention is okay how does the world mm -hmm. of this mind or this subject is is structured and how does it what is was what is the main plane in which it is it is organized yes is uh, is this correct uh, because if if there is if, if there is a particular story or a particular like say a book that says okay people are speaking about this and this and this and this and there is this particular question that i want to focus on so it doesn't seem like a like a cosmographic uh Structure, yeah. Yeah, and it, it it also I don't know I I didn't really hear a clear question, so maybe I'll just react react to what you have been saying. Uh, it is something that I, me working in the performing arts, what is irritating me since uh, quite a while, is the 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 theme based um, uh, practices and the theme based festivals and and so there are. Um, you, you you do a research about a very very specific theme or you do you make a work about a very specific theme there's a festival that works around a specific theme and i think um what cosmograms enable is also this more um this broader uh, more about more thinking about worldviews like um where a lot of different elements a lot of different topics are interconnected and it's also uh well I think it's a it's a contemporary experience that we feel that everything is connected and that that um, that uh, that we are part of of big entanglements and um, uh, environmentally, socially, etc. And so I also think that that um, that uh, yeah we should do away with this um, monothematic approach uh, that is very often uh, present in the arts, which. Um, to reflect a little bit further on that, um, uh, I think also has to do with the fact that uh, we're in a time where there's many artists uh, and there's not, and they're not all having the name Anna Teresa de Kiersmaker. So it also, I think, there's a purely economical reason why um, why these theme-based practices are more present because that's what attracts people. If if it's not the name of a famous artist, uh, then they're attracted by this topic. Um, so yeah. But uh, but I think this it has uh, some limits. I have a a very pragmatic question. Do you hear me or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so you could say the climate emergency forces us to reconsider um, our perceptions of the ordinary, like the the daily weather forecast becomes something very loaded and very uncanny. So. I wonder how can this orienting prose, like uh, Marcus one, which contributes in a way to this uh, uncanny feeling, help people to deal with the, a huge transition in which the familiar becomes unfamiliar. I would say it makes the chaos and uh, the chaos even bigger. I would say, or the complexity, or does it want to? Yeah, I wonder how do you how do you look at this kind of uh, yeah, in a, in a... yeah. So the the yeah. Um, well, maybe one first thing, because it's connected to this entangled division of, of the fact that we're in living in an entangled world. Mm -hmm. The word you use, climate emergency, it's something as a as a as an as a environmental activist. Um, I don't use anymore, um, and because of the fact that it is also a monothematic approach to a very big problem. Uh, we're talking about nine planetary boundaries, of which climate is only uh, one. And, uh, and so, the fact that that, uh, of course, for for understandable reasons, because climate uh, emergency or climate catastrophe is already complex in itself. Um, and so that's why often uh, I, uh, journalists and politicians I've spoken to you say, "Yeah, but we keep on using the word, even though we know, because people won't understand." But yeah, we start to. Uh, talk about what is really happening. Um, how so, how how would you call it then? I I I understand. I I am aware of the planetary boundaries, but how would you you would 
environmental i think environmental ecological i think this is a these are terms ah, emergent yeah okay Co combined with the uh, emergency you mean encompass more uh, and so that also encompass biodiversity okay. ocean acidification etc um but uh to return to your question uh mm -hmm. canniness indeed um a lot of uh artists are um hmm, you could say replicating the uncanniness or exaggerating the uncanniness um well i don't think ben marcus had uh, the ecological emergency in mind when he wrote his book in 1995 but but um i think a lot of artists who make these kind of uncanny uh strange and tangled works do nowadays um but um i think well how i interpret it from my point of view as a as an art lover and an, and an artist is that uh, there's maybe a kind of um, a way to be confronted with the, that uncanniness in an exaggerated way makes you um, could have something of a um, an, um, cat cathartic uh, element where you feel okay I've been through something and it helps me to cope um, so I've I've peered in pierced oh no peered into the dark the dark side uh, in this in this piece and so it helps me to to get up in the morning i don't know this is a possibility it's not my approach i think i am much more on the ursula k Le Guin side of, of things uh which is um which tries also to to touch upon something utopian um and not to um well not to neglect the catastrophic circumstances but also from there try to think worlds differently but in in good ways <laughs> let's say and not uh not get stuck in um, in passivity and in um, and in negativity. Although there's a lot of reasons uh, for that, of course. Um, so I hope I don't know if this is a somewhat of an answer to your question about the uncanniness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, some other questions about uh, this. Otherwise, I can go on to talk a little bit about my own uh, work. Yes. Okay. So, um, so I've been writing several um, versions of a story, uh, which is called Moddertong, which is a, a Dutchification of the word mother tongue. If you would translate it back to English, it would mean mud and tongue. And, uh, and so the topics, <laughs> the multi topics that interest me uh, are not the, the, the lightest or the smallest. Um, they are mother, which is part of this word earth which is part of mud and and uh, and language um so mother earth mother tongue um etc and so from these uh, huge topics i try to kind of construct a story uh which is um well my version of a cosmogram and uh um I won't be able to read the story here, uh, but for those of you who can understand Dutch, uh, there is a. I, I will show it um, the 18th of November in Kai Theater um, in the afternoon and in the evening at a festival called Ecopoli. So you're more than invited. Um, but so, uh, just to give you a very small excerpt. Warte. So I'll just read it. When the whole extended family cleans the house on Sundays, the forgotten mugs and glasses return to the big cupboard in the kitchen. There's something funny and sad about the fact that some of those mugs and glasses at the back of the cupboard are never used because there are just too many of them. Sometimes, out of pity, someone shifts a few to the front. Um, so the mugs and the glasses are just one uh, small element in a very big entangled hole um, where, as you can see in this um, small excerpt, also inanimate things um, uh, play a role. Um, but so next to uh, 30 human characters, there's also animals and there's uh, and there's. Um, and there's plants and 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 herbs um, who who also play a role and maybe the most important character is the sun. Um, and it's um, it's a story uh, about the daily life in a in a community, 
uh, set in an unspecified, unspecified time and space. Um, so we're not in the future, we're not in the past, we're not in the present per se, uh, or that's at least that's not clear. And there's uh, different languages spoken, so it's also not super clear where we are. Um, and uh, it, so it has, uh, as I already made clear, uh, it has a utopian element. So it's a, it's a utopian community. You could say a little bit of a commune, but uh, maybe also next uh, or 2.0 um, or 3.0. Um, so there's different ages uh, present. There's different people with different cultural backgrounds or so different languages um, and uh, and different genders. So there's also a gender spectrum. It's not, uh, there's not only men and women. Um, and there's also uh, a queer model of kinship, you could say, that replaces the nuclear family. So there's a lot of kids that are cared for by people who are not their parents. Um, and there's a, the, the, there's couples, but it's not like the most uh, important thing in the world. So the, the, the couple structure is, is present, but not overall the norm. Um, and then, uh, um, so it describes a daily life, which, mean, which means that not much very special is happening uh, in the community other than what they do normally. The only thing that changes in the story is that there's a big qualitative evolution in the sense that there's a heat wave um, arriving um, and staying uh, for too long. <laughs> and um, and so it has an impact on, on the community, of course, uh, and community in a large sense, the social community, but also its natural environment, etc. cetera. And, um, and so it's also... Um, it talks also about uh, this is a small drawing of the, what happens in the in the story, um, and um, so there's also a third part, let's say, in the in the in the qualitative evolution uh, that there's a an after there's an after the heat wave. And so that was the part that um, so I made many versions of this story, and that was a part, of course, that kept I kept on postponing because, yeah, how to imagine? <laughs> and, and so there's a there's there's a, a an afterwards as well, um, and so, um, so yeah, in this picture uh, in the drawing you see different elements of the. Um, of the of the socio ecological uh, community, you could say, um, and there's also um, the the dead are also a part of it, um, and, uh, and there's, there is a, a Hi. hello. I'm just listening to a conference. Yeah, come in, Tessa. Oh, <laughs> How you doing? No, no, you can come in. I'm just listening to a conference. Okay. Hey. Can we just ask you? Oh. That's a very nice voice. Um, and uh, so there's also a, an attempt at um, kind of an invention of new kind of spiritualities without getting immediately into a Starhawk kind of a, um, stuff. But it's, it's, a, the, so it's, there's a, a search for a spirituality that, uh, and, and also a search by people who are kind of, uh, who have a lot of how do you say that in English? Hot water, warm uh, water, freeze. We say in Dutch. Uh, who have a lot of um, fear uh, for for going there, but they, they go there uh, nevertheless. Um, and uh, and so yeah, there's also a lot of um, farming uh, going on, and there's the sun that plays a big role, and there's uh, the sun is giving energy to to uh, solar panels, but there's also of course the heat. That gets trapped in um, in the atmosphere, and uh, and so yeah, there's there's uh, it's daily life. So the most important things that happen are cooking and and working in the garden, and uh, it's not um, how do you say uh, it's not how are they called again the ones who were like uh, destroying machines in the nineteenth century. The Luddite, it's not a Luddite community. It's, it's well, more low-tech than the community we have nowadays. But, uh, but well, there's computers. Um, 
and uh, and there's factories etc but bon. so to give you a brief impression um but i promise to tell you about um, some of the compositional uh, problems i encountered while writing the story um and you have them here in the list and um and so i can just talk about them one by one and you just interrupt me if there's something not clear or if you have something to ask or to add um but so the first problem i uh, i had to deal with is like what is the cosmos i'm writing about exactly um and what are its boundaries um and so um to give you a like a, an element of, of the, the the creation process is so so most of the things happen in a garden and in the house and a very very big house and so there's a lot of people there's a lot of uh, animals etc and there's an excursion to the sun to the core of the sun that's more or less where the the elements or the places in in the story but at a certain point somebody who heard a previous version of this story to ask me um yeah but these people they seem to live in a bubble uh, in a kind of autarkic bubble uh, and what about the outside world like what is what is happening there and so it's not that i all of a sudden enlarged the scope hugely to uh, a city or 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 a, or or a country or a, or a continent but um but the, the boundaries of the cosmos became more permeable after she asked that question and i gave uh, by giving uh, the different characters professions so someone was working in a factory another one was a teacher and so there were more and more connections to suggestions of an outside world but um but yeah the, the cosmos uh, stayed focused on the house and the garden and the sun um the so this was a first um issue i think it's it's a uh, last week uh when there was uh, the conference of, of orion there was also somebody talking about like what are the exact boundaries of an ecosystem so it, there's also of course the the there's always the question when you um when you make a cosmogram a scientific or a spiritual or an artistic one is like what yeah what is the world uh that i try to uh depict um uh, and uh, where does it stop um Yes. And then um, there's another uh, problem that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, that, um, so I already mentioned uh, the, the metaphor of the, the theatrical decor uh, that Latour often uses um, and um, to contrast it with the human interactions. And of course, here in this, in, in my story as well, I wanted to uh, not only focus on on uh, human human interactions but also on interactions between humans and 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 uh, and non-humans uh animals there's of course there's many different kinds of interactions between humans and animals we eat them uh we pet them um and so these different um interactions are also there we get irritated by them because they sting uh, or they, they um, they're they're like mosquitoes or and so so all these different kinds of interactions um uh, also play a role and uh, and so they're not only um yeah in the background but they are active elements so they they push other elements uh to become active um and uh, uh for example when it when it's about the um, the relation between a human being and an animal what was very inspiring for me is the uh the companion species manifesto by by donna haraway uh where she writes about um her own dog and uh, and and the kind of um uh very um situated and specific relationship uh, there is between her and her dog and um and those kinds of things and then of course uh, there's also um uh less uh, um less uh cozy relations with animals in the sense that uh, at a certain point there's also exodes uh, coming in so um uh, there's too many of a certain specific animal. There's a, there's the, um, um, how do you say that in English? Ladybugs. So there's ladybugs are beautiful. They're very, very sweet. But the Chinese version is uh, apparently very um, aggressive and, uh, and, and, and takes over. 
uh, and so there's a lot of Chinese ladybugs uh, coming in uh, there without, of course, um, well, it is it is thematized at a certain point in the story uh, without um, uh, China bashing, <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, yes, you have a question. Yeah, maybe a general question in your writing. Do you what what do you make of the the concept of the hero of following what do you, do you still use the one agent going through a story or is it like really multiple agents no. and so so there, there's indeed uh, this was um it's an interest that has been haunting me since several years like how can you write a story that doesn't um have like one character or a very sh um, small group of main characters um and so as I told before, so there's 30 human characters in in the, in the in the story, but some of them only appear once. They're mentioned once, but some of them, um, uh, uh, yeah, most of them are on the same plane. Like they they are. It's a horizontal plane. Um, so there's not a lot of um, plot hierarchies between the different characters. The only thing is that some characters appear maybe a little bit more, but uh, but. You couldn't call them main characters. They are, they are, um, uh, yeah, elements in this entangled whole. And and yeah, the, the maybe the main character, as I said before, is the sun. But then, yeah, maybe I guess uh, there is a big challenge for the audience to to be able to follow something that is less. Uh, such as, as usual. So, so yeah, I I, I I I told the story before and and. Um, what I say on beforehand, before I start telling the story, and this kind of liberates people from uh, knowing all the names, because I also mention all the names of the thirty characters, is that I say you haven't, you don't have to remember all of the names, um, and so it liberates people from having to follow all these threads. They can also just look at it as as a kind of a, a landscape, an evolving landscape, uh, where sometimes maybe they recognize, ah, yeah, but this name I've heard before, and they were doing something in that other room but it is not per se necessary uh for the story to 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 remember all these people and all these all these um characters um and um ah, yeah maybe also on uh yeah it's not super present but it's something maybe for a next version is a uh, is how technology is also an active element in the whole because uh, so it's not only about human beings in a natural environment but also how uh, te technological elements can play a role um, they are there but not super super present um, and uh, yeah and, and like a sub problem you could say in this problem is that uh, there was at a certain point um, uh, the, the, the difficulty of how not to make it too empty because it's just daily life, so it's not very eventful, um, but also not too full at the same time, because if if your background is not like the impressionistic backgrounds you have in a lot of stories, like, okay, we're in a room, but what is in the room is not super important. We just listen to the conversation between hu two human beings. But of course, all the elements in the background or a lot of the elements in the background spring to the foreground. Isn't it too full either? So... The, the question of is it too empty or too full um, was something yeah that that kind of was bugging me um, during the during the writing, um, and uh, yeah so this is about the second um, problem. The third one is about perspective. So so from which perspective do you write um, or no? Well, I write from my own perspective, but from which perspective is the story told? And um, and there is also well, it's this is an ongoing research uh, and an ongoing. I think this was not the last version of the text that I've written recently, but um, but uh, a term that is very inspiring when I think about this perspective is the oligopticon. Uh, it's again, I'm a, a big Latour fan, as you might have noticed already, um, that I got from Latour, and uh, and so. It's of course contrasting with um, the the panopticon, uh, Foucault's panopticon, um, where uh, I, I guess a lot of you know what it is. But for those who don't, um, it's uh, this um, idea in, in prison architecture where 
there's a central element um, in the building uh, where the the guardian is seated, who can look around um, to the to the to the to, to the rest of the building and see all the prisoners. The prisoners don't do, cannot see the the guard, um, and they also cannot see each other. So there's a there's a very uh, huge hierarchy in the one who sees and the one and the ones who are seen. And it's of course um, um, a very uh, good metaphor to talk about the surveillance uh, state. Um, but uh, the oligopticon is um, is a different kind of uh, device, vi vision, vi visual device, um, in the sense that it's it's about a sum of uh, particular detailed uh, observations, and so they never completely come together. So there's no total vision, there's no overview, but there are there's a suggestion. Of of a of a whole, you could maybe um, uh, look at it also with the metaphor of the dot drawing. So you have the dots, and they and and so without without connecting them, you see the dot drawing, and you you see like there's a, a structure appearing, uh, but they are they are not um, not uh, unified, um, and so yeah, uh, the oligopticon um, as a narrative perspective uh, was um, is is. So and what that means exactly for for the story is that um, the this perspective shifts. So at a certain point, as I said, you're in the in the in the center of the sun, uh, and you travel back to Earth as a, as a as a as a sun, sun solar beam. Uh, but then there's also um, you follow a kid that is playing in the grass with uh, with the insects, and so that it goes from from a very small um, uh, perspective to a larger one, and so it sh the perspective shifts. Um, so yes, the oligopticon. Any questions or extra references or? Uh, it reminds me this oligopticon uh, of an octopus type of uh, of a uh, or organization of an of an organism, and and I I find it extremely fascinating that uh, more and more like in in many different do domains actually more and more people start to explore this type of cognition yes and, and and for example you know like in management there's like there's so much talk about decentralization yes and uh, and distribution yes and and in in technology development yes and it seems that we are we are very interestingly in the era where you know like and, and now you you show it from your literature yes that that uh, if if people look back at our times i suppose from like 50 years from now if you know there there will be <laughs> There will be such a perspective. So, uh, it, I, I, I suppose this will be one of the key themes that we are actually living in. This this distribution of of uh, cognition that comes together as one organism, like kind of like with many different eyes looking, mm. like seeing on different scales in different dimensions, but but still coming together as as one story. So I, I very much like this. Yeah. Uh, now I all of a sudden think about the noosphere that we what we were talking about last week, but. Um... Yeah. So, so it's uh, an, it's another narrative of of of, of the structure. Yes, I I just you know like I, I want to share an association with what you have been talking about when you are when you have this beautiful drawing and this community and it reminds me of um, when you are a child and when you are learned like you are basically developing your perspective of the world you you get such a such a another word this holopticism. Yes. So you see like. Uh, exactly. Uh, just um, um, holopticism is uh, is a is a word that uh, Jean Paul Nobel no Jean Francois Nobel is using uh, for for type of uh, perception of of the uh, reality where you see everything what is happening not in this panopticon way but you are a member and you are in a room so you see everybody what what they are doing and and examples he gives is like for example a music music band that you you can respond and you can you can improvise because it's happening in one space yes so in this in this type of community that we are describing okay you have a sense of the or like a holistic sense of the world yes mm -hmm. and uh, 
yeah, and, and and very interesting. You bring those those ladybugs that are Chinese, yes, and and there there is always a, some kind of like a, like a problematics to it, and there is always some kind of boundary violation that okay, that there is aliens, yes, and and they are they are becoming a, a, a structural uh, structural problem. And what, what what when you were describing it, what what I remembered. Uh, Hi. Uh, what what I remembered uh, just just last week we had a class at the School of Thinking, a postgraduate that that we have, and we were doing an exercise where three groups of students were asked to actually create their realities. So they are were supposed they sit together, they create the whole world. Mm -hmm. They just got a map uh, and they were situated somewhere, and they had to from the scratch uh, in, uh, invent all the history, what they are, you know. And one group came up with a very ideal ideal the kind of I idyllic uh, um, you know that they are kind of non-dualists and they are just sit and like, they are in balance and everything like you know they, they, they don't understand the, the concept of the problem and then of course as, as in a workshop what we did was that we sent you know a, a mystery from each group to another group <laughs> and it was so funny to observe they were trying to keep their narrative and not say that the others are a problem because they were supposed to not to know the, the concept yes but the, the the but it was it was very very interesting how they didn't know how to phrase you know the state of being in balance when they are not being understood anymore and they don't understand what what oh. uh, yeah so so i think for cosmograms that's that's a that's a question i have you know like how do you deal with uh, uh shouldn't there be always a, an unknown in a cosmogram and then it stops being a cosmogram yes because there is an like there is a cognition from outside yes and and supposedly by definition in a cosmogram everything is inside your story yes so what what's your what, like what, how how do you deal with otherness and outside and unknown in yeah i think that brings us back to the to the first um to the first uh, problem is is uh, like what are these boundaries how permeable are they um and uh and indeed like this this there's, there's not only an in, internal um uh internal workings but there's also also always an, an outside influence and indeed like the chinese ladybugs are 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 an example of that Yeah, <laughs> there's a yeah. I think uh, it's indeed about this di distinction between closed systems and open open systems. Um, uh, yeah, and and maybe it's also a spectrum between closeness and openness. Yes. Hello, Orion. Uh, you want to say something? <laughs> we can't hear you. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, but I had to unmute myself. Sorry. Um, yeah, I wanted to. I mean, there's a few things to 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 say. I mean, I think. I think it's a lot of affinity between what you're doing and, um, well, what I'm been doing and trying to do and what we're, we're trying to do what by bringing um by bringing different forms of art and and, and theater into into clear and connect up these conversations as in i think i think and i think that a lot of what um there's a lot of answers to your question i think in cybernetics and systems theory i think um i think that it's very also concerned with this notion of boundaries like exactly like how do you define the boundary of the system that you're talking about and i do kind of wonder what happens if you just substitute the word system for cosmos in this like what that opens up in terms of like creating references and like connection points between these different different disciplines different um areas of different conversations um but i think there's a lot there's a lot in there just in it in generally, and I like to, so to coming back to Marta's last point, for example, about the element of the unknown. 
I think that's also quite interesting, like different views on a on a, on a on a cosmos or a system, because in a lot of systems, this notion of incomplete information is super important, right? That the that one of the things that makes the system a system or makes the cosmos a cosmos is that the, none of the the agents don't none of the agents have complete information about what's going on, unlike a panopticon where. Um, some of the agents know everything that's going on, and some of the agents have almost have got you know almost no idea about what's going on, and so there's this huge differential of information, and oftentimes I think in a in certain kinds of complex systems, yeah, it's there's this kind of incomplete um, level of knowledge. Uh, yeah, can I just quickly react to what you have been saying, and then? And then you can go on, or do you want to go on first? I have other notes, but there was I was also I was also just happy listening to your six points um, before before coming back. But then, uh, yes, I'll, I'll just quickly re respond because so I'm I'm not a as you probably all are uh, very much into cybernetics. My my um, link with system thinking, if I can say that, um, is a. Uh, is Latour's um, um, uh, actor network theory that that's my main source of inspiration? I don't know if it holds scientifically. It, I'm also more dealing with it from an artistic point of view. Um, but um, and also what you're saying reminds me also of an interest, and it's I think also a little bit present in the story that I've I've been writing is an interest in anarchy. Uh, anarchy in the sense of as 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 a social model as as a way of uh as a way of um uh yeah uh, interacting with each other uh which is of course uh based on meetings <laughs> a lot of meetings and uh dialogues between uh between people um and it's uh i think also um well that's more my activist side but I started a, a campaign two years ago around democratic innovation called the Burger Parliament, which is a lot about um, uh, the well the, the the ideas that also David van Rebroek has put forth um, around uh, deliberative democracy and um, having an informed uh, selection, uh, representative selection of the population. Uh, dialogue with each other and come up with with uh, policy proposals i think all of these things are also connected to that and i think it's it's a uh, it is politically speaking um uh, uh a direction i think if i think about a positive direction that is very much part of that uh in a very complex world we need a lot of uh different perspectives um uh in dialogue with each other and um so yeah i don't know wanted to connect or, or react with that that maybe you have something more. Yeah, yeah. And does that does that does that go along with the actor network theory, this um, deliberative democracy? Do you feel that those fit together? Two different elements. I, I'm not per se saying that the actor network theory is, of course, because of of also the 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 inanimate uh, elements um, that 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 also play a role in in this in the social structure. And uh, I really love. Uh, it has been reissued recently. Uh, love his kind of um artistic uh translation of the actor network theory uh his portrait of the city of paris i don't know if you know about it but it's, it's a really beautiful book where he uses the actor network theory to 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 make an impossible portrait of the city of paris um and uh, yeah but but um it's not per se connected to deliberative democracy it's just two different elements that i associate with what you were saying the quotes are in the book yeah. i can look it up yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. No. Yeah. There's someone in the room also who wants to say something. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have to. Do you hear the people in the Zoom room? Do you Does hear the person? Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, my apologies that I was too late. I come from the one meeting and I fall into this one. You're I'm forgiven. actually interested you're in what you're doing because I'm not only doing research here, but I teach at RITS. Uh, this, uh, we have something in common in this respect. 
Um, I just have a, a few small questions and one remark based on what I heard now and what I read before. I hope maybe in the discussion afterwards we can uh, come back a little bit to it. Um, <clears throat> when I hear this discussion about the, do, do cosmograms have an outside, it's of course a very important problem. It has not only to do with uh, the part and whole relation to the parts within the system relating to the whole, but also this fundamental problem raised by Hegel in the sense that if there is not an outside, you cannot have an inside either. Then there is no interaction anymore that defines what the boundary is and the whole thing becomes unstable and collapses. So I think we have to take this fundamental insight with us. There are different potential solutions for this. The one Hegel proposed was a kind of universal mind. I'm not sure that I'm favorite of that, but there are different ways of looking at it, but the question stands in any case. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, and this relates to this idea of knowledge, complete or incomplete knowledge, it's very important to see that once you are part of a world, in whatever way, you can never have an all-encompassing viewpoint, even not in the panopticon. The, the person sitting in the panopticon remains situated within the world, and you cannot have this godlike perspective from the outside. And this is also something that often is overlooked or neglected, but there are different kinds mm -hmm. of, how would I say, unknowing. That's just my small remark. Thanks. And by the way, there is a person in, in CLEA, Evo Bussenius, who is doing modeling of political anarchy in mathematical yes, complex we have systems. Met. Well, okay, that was what I wanted to suggest. Um, there was also another person in the Zoom room, I think, who wanted to say something, or no? Yes, yes, uh, maybe just, um, did you feel the urge to explore the way in which these characters interact with the decor, or they are the decor themselves, of course, but did you feel the urge to make them grow or something, or learn from something from it, or they just keep on interacting? Or do they evolve in the story? Or that was not the, the point you wanted to? Oh, yeah, that's my question. Just because the... I can imagine if the decor comes to the forefront and the decor becomes alive and um, that does something with you, either you, yeah, I can imagine that does something with human beings, but also with the non-human beings themselves. Yeah, did you feel the urge to make them learn from something from this? Or I don't know. Um, I don't know about the learning, but, but what you're saying. Change, yeah. Brings me to a thought um, is uh, that it is not. It was not only about making the 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 scenography more alive. It's also it also has an impact of the ones who were normally in front of the background, because it makes the human interactions less important at the same time. So you could say they they go they come a little bit together in the middle. Um, for example, where a kiss or a murder. In, in a story where the background is in the back, <laughs> uh, they would be like very important elements. While in the stories I imagine, uh, they are details. Um, so they're details to the bigger qualitative evolution of heating, for example. And so uh, they are, of course, there and there is uh, love and there is a, a lot of different kinds of interactions, but they are only important as parts of a whole and not... Um, uh, not so much in themselves. I don't know if I make myself clear, but it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's clear. And I, but I was wondering if by going through this experience of background and foreground coming together in the middle, what do background and foreground become after being in the middle? Maybe background can can change as well by becoming in the middle together with the foreground, or doesn't care. I don't know, but yeah, that's maybe. I, I wonder what comes next, then, when they are in the middle, then, yeah, okay. There's more... Middle. What happens yeah. to them, or at least, no. It, should, it must do something with boats, yeah. yeah. Or in, in what, what it could produce in human beings, I hope, or, well, that's maybe the suggestion, is more awareness. Um, so, uh, less the paardenbril. We say in Dutch, I don't know, the horse glasses is that, if that exists in English, but so the, the this like leather things that you you don't see the the peripheral sides. I think that is um 
that is maybe what it produces uh on the on the on the human side of the of the, of the middle <laughs> um and on the other side i don't know i don't think they um, they yeah they just go on as they were going on always but it's it's the the change happens on the on the human the side human side yeah okay Ah, yeah. So, so indeed. So, the, the, so yeah. What, what with language, mother and earth. So, so there's um, um, well, there's a suggestion, of course, of mother earth. Um, but uh, yeah, the earth is an important element in the sense that people are, uh, the the work in the garden is an important element in the story, and so the interactions with um the surface of the earth and and the right underneath the surface of the earth. And the importance of the of all the small um, species that interact there are in symbiosis with each other there um, is, and it's also uh, at a certain point. There's one of the um, things that I use a lot is lists. So a lot of um, what you would say, okay, I see some green there in the garden. No, you have all the names of the different plants, and so also names. That probably you have never heard of, but uh, it's names of specific plants, and um, and it's it's something that I uh, read where I, I I can't remember where, but I found it really inspiring. That um, let's say hundred years ago, people were the, the knowledge, the vocabulary to talk about the natural environment was much more shared, while now uh, the this. Vocabulary has been replaced by spectacularized vocabulary. We, we know which actor dates which actress, and we know um, a lot about the society of the spectacle. But we have lost the language to talk about our natural environment. And so the list of, of, of names for plants and species, uh, there's beautiful names for insects, um, yeah, are used there. Uh, so... Yes. Uh, explain a bit more. <laughs> I can't translate, but it's the name. It's a, re a reference, a very precise reference to a specific kind of sea blue. And it describes like a train that consists of parts that has this nice blue sea-like, blue greenish sea-like color. And it's the, the name of a microscopic worm that lives in the sand of the beach. And without it, the beach would just crumble because it holds the sand together. And that's really, it's it's really, it just, I, I remember this, when I studied biology, we had this kind of, Stage. We went to the Atlantic coast in this very old end of 19th century building. There was a laboratory there that existed since a long time. We had our own materials with us, but we had, there were still the copper, the copper, um, microscopes and the old books in the it was really an incredible place to to sit and do research and they had all the, there were all these fauna books little booklets in which worms and other animals were drawn by hand not pictures but drawn described and these were used if you get, went to the sea to the beach you take a little bit of sand you had to clean it out in a specific way not to kill all the organisms and then you could, under the binocular or under the microscope, see the most fantastic creatures. I mean, Jurassic Park is nothing, huh? Just go to the beach and look what you find under the microscope. And and then you could find in the books the name and the description of those. Yeah. So by, it gives me a kind of sentiment when you speak <laughs> about um Yeah, maybe I see the clock ticking. Maybe it's not bad if I go on a little bit with uh, describing my problems. Um, and... Um... So yeah, you could see yourselves as a as psychiatrist listening to my problems, um, and um, so the the fourth one is the the one uh, description versus action. So um, as a, as I already told you, there's not so much happening uh, in in the in the classic plot like sense, uh, like a murder or or a vita between families or or such things. So it's daily life. Um, it's quite uneventful. You could say 
uh, maybe you remember the the quote that I read to you from Ursula K. Le Guin, which is about um, these oats and and gathering these oats and gathering these oats and gathering these oats. So there's a lot of repeti repetitivity. I don't know if I say it well uh, in daily life, uh, and so also in the story. Um, and um, and yeah, and there's also there's a, a description of how this world works and interacts. Uh, where action is, of course, an element, but not the overarching element, and um, and so the the, the sub problem is, of course, like doesn't it make your story boring uh, because not a lot is happening, it's not plot driven, um, and well, uh, this of course depends on your qualities as a writer. Um, if you come the 18th, I I'll let you judge by yourself, but um, uh, the um. Another uh, another element is it's something well that I uh, described before is the events uh, in the story are of less importance um, in this yeah so the 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 kiss and the murder is is a detail uh, if there would be such a thing as a as a murder um, and so it's more there's of course things that that change but it's more this bigger qualitative evolution so it is of course the heat um, that is. Um, the heat wave that is uh, that is there and that has its impacts and that pushes generates a lot of movement in the in in the cosmic hole um it has ecological impacts of course it has physical impacts it has psychological impacts people get tired irritated angry so it has social impacts um and um and so on so 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 there's the this question of description versus action that I um that I yeah have been encountering as well. Um, then a fifth uh problem is um is the symbiosis and the creation conflicts. Um, uh, the many of the interrelationships between the elements in this cosmic whole, they are or uh symbiotic. So very much Lynn Margulis uh, inspired um, and um, and so yeah maybe the happy the happy side of, of the ecosystem <laughs> uh, but then there's also conflicts also as well of course and so creation conflicts I don't know I haven't read the English translation I read the book in French and in Dutch um, of Latour where he uses the word verwekkingsconflicten so I don't well if you would translate it, it's like creation conflicts, but it's a bit uh, to explain it. It's as an element in an ecosystemic whole. You of course generate the conditions for ongoingness, for for making your life possible. Um, and so you gather food, you make it warm if it's cold, etc. So all these things you do to make your life go on is. Um, and make and procreate, uh, and so that you you also have uh, kids and and, and grandkids, etc. So so you, your species doesn't die, and um, um, but then of course very often there is a conflict because other species also have their need their um, these conditions uh, to to thrive, and so yeah, also the Chinese ladybugs. Um, want to thrive but of course they make uh, a lot of other um, ongoingnesses impossible and so these conflicts that arise uh, from from those and um, and yeah um, I think on a on a larger uh, scale you could also say that uh, a part of the environmental catastrophe you could describe as one big creation conflict between uh, humanities activities and um and 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 the rest um and uh and so of course our um way of life makes a lot of other uh, conditions impossible for other species um and um yeah so and then maybe the last um uh, compositional problem is uh, the end of the world um so uh how often the end of the world is is depicted as an event. Uh, so you have a meteorite crashing into Earth, or you have uh, the atom bomb destroying a total city. Um, but uh, so the, the I think the the end of the world we're experiencing, or the ends of worlds we're experiencing, is um, 
are more uh, processes. And of course, from a geological perspective, they go very fast. Um, but at the same time, they're not like a snap of the finger. There, there is a, there is an, uh, a process of, of um, uh, degeneration. Uh, there's also counter processes of regeneration. But well, the degeneration is is the is the the stronger force. Um, and um, so the endless process. Uh, well, this this is going to be a mouthful, but I would describe as the gradual disintegration. Of interrelated interrelated socio ecological cosmoses, um, so of ecosystems and societies, and so um, of course it's not only um, species um, getting extinct. There's also yeah social fabrics that gets um, um, disconnected, um, and uh, and so yeah, to think about this more the generation of an ecosystem and how um well somebody told me uh, I, I was saying yeah you could see it as these all these interrelated negative feedbacks but apparently it's positive feedbacks uh but but then seen negatively you know uh so yeah that therefore i need your your knowledge to 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 say it rightly um but uh yeah <laughs> um and so uh so yeah, how to how to describe this? And so at at a certain point, uh, so the end of the second part, you could say, things all of a sudden go quickly because of course there's also in this ends as processes there's different velocities. There's a slowness, the kind of the 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 the, the frog in the in the in the hot water. Uh, but then of course there's a moment where you have tipping points and where things all of a sudden go quickly, uh, and and things. Um, as they are all interrelated, of course, uh, there's a there's a higher velocity, and so yeah, things go quickly at the end of the the second part. But then there's a regenerative um, element as well. But yeah, so um, there is another ten minutes. Uh, if there's any questions or remarks or associations. Uh, Verwerkingsconflicten. Gestation? Ah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe that's. Yeah. Then creation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because the book is the book is translated, so I think I'll just. I think it's uh, not down to earth, but the one after the one he wrote uh, after COVID. Uh, yeah, I don't know the English uh, title. Uh, well, your last remarks about the end of the world as a process uh, reminded me of something that very much struck me recently. That is that now there is, in a sense, a kind of a, I must almost say, a new intellectual genre appearing where people kind of take the end of the world as a given. They kind of take that collapse of civilization, the ecosystem is nearly certain and so what we should do is to prepare ourselves psychologically for it. Now it just reminded me of it because uh, Clement forwarded me the that announcement of somebody I know, um, Michael, uh, Michael Daut, who did some very interesting world work about uh, the evolutionary epic but who in his later years seems to have gone into this, what he calls post-doom mode. Mm -hmm. That means we are doomed, but we should resign ourselves to that fate and try to live by accepting it. So it's a kind of... A... And then there was another book that I recently read by Peter Russell, who is the guy who came up with the term global brain. So we know him well in that respect, who also has written a book like that, where he says, I don't remember the title, it's something like uh, being said about humanity, where he kind of argues that humanity is doomed and that we should learn to psychologically accept that fact and find peace with it. Uh, I don't know what how that fits in with your. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. There's um, 
uh, yeah, there's a lot of those thinkers <laughs> nowadays, and also not only thinkers but also practices. You have uh, Joanna Macy, who's who's uh, busy with these grief circles, and and those things are very present also in the arts world uh, and 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 in the activist world for sure. Uh, I, I also Joanna Macy is a is is someone who's really designing practices to to deal with those things with and and. Actually, well, Extinction Rebellion, where, where that, that I have uh, or, organized many actions with, is um, we have a, an element of our of what we do is called regenerative culture, which is all about um, not about the more masculinist uh, civil disobedience uh, kind of actions, but more how to deal with emotions that arise well from actions, from maybe police reactions to actions, but also from the general. Uh, predicament uh, we're living um and uh um and so yeah there's a lot of emotions connected to that and a lot of grief and anger and 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 so how to channel those there are techniques uh to deal with those uh with those things uh or they are being well there are techniques and they have are being developed uh as we speak as well there are there are two views you can say, well, we are angry about uh, what's happening to the world or we are uh, uh, we are in grief because of all these species disappearing, but we still expect that the world will survive. And there are those who say, well, there is no sense uh, grieving or being angry because anyway, it's doomed. So I don't know whether you also know people who are reasoning in that uh, fatalistic way. Yeah, you also like, have extinction rebellion. The name itself, rebellion, says you are not fatalist. You want to yeah, rebel against. No, no, no. There, there's well, um, you have Paul Kings North. Uh, is also Paul King Kings North. It's it's uh, interesting, but there's many of these characters. Um, and and this is the whole spectrum of people who say, uh, yeah, also friends of mine who say we just give up political activism and we we go and live in a place where we get to be as autarchic as possible if, um yeah. yeah if i may add something the the way i i mean a plausible interpretation that i see with this attitude is is a seemingly kind of wise attitude towards death in general like to be ready to accept death but i think that uh, like somebody wise is ready to to die and to accept it as a uh, as a fact of life that we we all die but here the fallacy is is to to apply it to to planet earth as a whole or to the whole of civilization it's yeah. of course wrong it's not because individual individuals die that the whole has to die and since we think more and more at a global scale um yeah maybe as these people age uh they they are also trying to to accept their own death, and then they they project this to planet Earth and say, "Yeah, okay, we should just accept also that the planet Earth." Paul Ehrlich uh, yeah. uh, predicted collapse already in the 1970s yeah. and 1980s, and when it didn't happen, he just postponed it, and now he's still saying <laughs> it will be soon. So and of course, by the time that he's dead, nobody will be able to, to show him any more. <laughs> Maybe just as a, as a small reference as well, a very beautiful book that is talking about these uh, issues and also about like the re what is the relation between your own death and extinction, uh, which is also, of course, a whole field of thinking is developing around those th that is uh, learning to die. It's a very um, short book by uh, two people. I can't remember their name now, but uh, but they're canadian and um yeah and it's also i had to think about it because you were talking about wisdom and it's explicitly referring to wisdom literature like you have in the bible for example with the ecclesiastes or or uh, or other kinds of um yeah literatures yes but of course all the people that write such books are still alive right i mean <laughs> Yeah, 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 okay, but <laughs> no, 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 but I mean, 
I only partially am with this because it's not because you cannot just project from your own mortality to society or the world as a whole. It is totally not unconceivable that the global civilization collapses. That's perfectly conceivable. The idea that we heat for a kind of, of uh, how would I say, plan because we are now global, partially always, we are not completely global, but there is a global structure. Because that exists, it is perfectly conceivable that that catastrophic events on a global scale take place. That's perfectly possible. That's not ridiculous or necessarily a fallacy. I don't say... I don't... Yeah, yeah, but okay, but there are many things that are said by others that are claimed as certainties, which are not. I mean, it's it's not a fallacy to make such a statement. It's it's mm. just something which can be debated. That's, that's of I, course, I, clear. I think also... Uh, mm. If, if, yeah, it, 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 maybe it, it need a reaction to that because it's it's of course well as an activist you get confronted with that often as well as an environmental activist to to be a, a alarmist and, and to be very negative. I think the the book that is that is maybe the the most um, in your face about the end of the world. I couldn't finish it. It's uh, Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. Um, I advise you to try and finish it. Um, it's a, it's a sign. He, he's a science journalist who, um, who doesn't see himself as a, as in very, how do you say, he, he's not a green boy. He, he's um, a young And so he, um, he just said, I want to know where we are environmentally speaking and so he went to read a lot of scientific studies etc and so the whole book is just uh, every sentence has a has a link to to a to a scientific source and um and it's um it's true that it is it is not certain and of course there that i think we always need to have that uh open uh that possibility but the likeliness is very very high <laughs> if we if we go on uh, as we're going on and but I I would be very curious to hear your no. I would be very curious to hear your opinion about the book. Just a, just a small reaction also to what you were saying, like about the indoctrination of the the, the generations. Um, so, me and some of my friends in in activism, we are setting up a campaign around degrowth, and um, and we had a, a a meeting with a journalist yesterday who is organizing like an international conference of investigative journalists from the Guardian and BBC, and so like really not. Uh, stupid um marginal journalists and uh, and and um and one of the things that came up in the conversation was yeah but uh, a lot of journalists shy away from telling yeah sometimes negative uh stories um because it is it is wait wait, wait, wait but can i can i finish my point so so um well um and uh I see that uh, in in the in the newspapers that I read um, that there are uh, that there is a, a hesitancy and a fear to be too negative, and so to um, and so what my friend who's a, who's an artist as well uh, told uh, this this uh, journalist was that he often goes and speak speak in in in, in schools and uh, and actually and he speaks like bluntly about uh, where we are environmentally speaking and um and he says that the reactions are actually quite um that they that there's a has a liberating effect to talk about uh, to to see things at face value to look things in the in, in the eye and that people are taken seriously and that it's not um and and that to speak from even though it is a dark place uh, a potentially dark place um that uh that if we start from there and from from where we are, that then only 
some kind of hope is possible because then uh because a lot of the the um a lot of the the stories are not told a lot of the facts are not mentioned um so okay i don't know which newspapers you read but if you watch uh the 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 vrt uh which i don't often do anymore um it's uh it doesn't tell you where we are it's there's no um there's no um full awareness of of the let's say the nine planetary boundaries this is this, this only the fact that in journalism there's mostly talk about the climate and not about all the other planetary boundaries is a uh, yeah yeah um But okay, um, I think we should not forget that there is a difference between the system or society or civilization and the world. This is also a distinction we have to make. One can conceive of a collapse of the system, but the world continues to exist. And the ecosystem will be transformed, but it will, like, like after this, the dispersion of the dinosaurs, it will reform itself and start something new. I don't say this is true, but there is a, this is indeed true. There is a difference between the system constructed by humanity on, as a layer on top of the world. And that's something we have to distinguish as well. I do not plead for this. I think idiotic reasoning like, oh, it's not a problem when we disappear as a species, blah, blah, blah. That's ridiculous because you are part of the species. I mean, but the system and the world is not the same thing. This point that you make about the liberating effect of facing the things in the eye, Horvat, I'm not sure whether I pronounce it correctly, the, the, the good companion friend of Varoufakis, uh, has written a small but brilliant little book on the apocalypse. I forgot the, the exact title, where he says that indeed the apocalypse is already here in a kind of daily like manner. And he gives the example that there are now, I mean, the, the not the feedback, but the feed in loop, if you want, that there are now already touristic excursions to the site of um, not Fukushima, but the Russian one, Chernobyl. Yes. There are, there are, there are, there is quite an industry of tourism to go to Chernobyl already, like and he, he he sees this as part of the fact that we are already in the collapse. Yeah, can I show you a? Can I show you a picture, Martin? Can you can you see this now? Can you see this? Uh... Okay, well. What is this? So it's just um. Just relating to this, it's uh, something that I saw in uh, in the the metro, uh, the, the small uh, paper that you get in the, in the train. It said, oh, yeah. It's a dossier that says SOS Zwitkein, who clearly is stalwart in the capital. Uh, so how do you clothe yourself stylishly during a heat wave? Um, so yeah. Uh, that's that's I see why you mentioned it, but. Even in the south, when there was not yet this climate crisis, people would more worry about how to dress themselves properly yeah. without sweating all the time. But the fact that there is tourism, so the, the, the catastrophe itself becomes a business model. That's actually the point that I want to make. And that's something else. That's another level, so right? But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, um, maybe. Uh... We can we can conclude indeed on on this thing of the end of the world, um, and and it it's I'm uh, surprised or or uh, I'm curious um, this this hesitance from well this specific place clear has has a specific history has a specific uh, focus um, uh, that there's this hesitancy towards indeed to too apocalyptic uh, as, 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 as um, or the, the, the collapsologists are, 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 are indeed um, uh, looked at critically, yeah, which, the... no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm not just hesitant about collapse. I'm very much a uh, in uh, in opposition to the idea that we are on the border of a collapse, people have been have been. Did you say denial? <laughs> apocalypses. Yeah. People have been speaking I'm about apocalypses for the whole, for, for thousands of years, and they have never happened. 
Sorry, but the, the, the ecosystem and society are much more resilient than people think. People have no idea how adaptive complex systems are. But so this idea like, oh, if that will happen, then nothing will work anymore. It's like the year 2K book, they were also yeah. predicting. But so the, 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 the exceptionality of the, the, the time we're in, this is something you would relativize. That's exceptional. Every time, no, nothing has happened. Yeah. yeah, but this is this is a specific kind of scientific ideology, which is it's 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 a standpoint, right? I mean, the disappearance of the Roman Empire you can describe as a collapse, right? Mm -hmm. You can you can this you can you can this you. But Franz, I am now talking. It's 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 indeed to a certain extent a measure of a matter of point of view. But you cannot say that scientifically there is no such thing as collapse. I think that it is important to see that because we have for the first time, and this is the, the new element, that we have, if only partial, global cycles of connection on the level of the system and civilization, that for the first time something like a global collapse on that level becomes uh, conceivable at least. And that's a new thing because something not only conceivable, potentially is it more than conceivable. I'm not speaking out on this, but you cannot say it's just a fantasy. It could happen. Francis, we can't hear you without the mic. What I'm saying is there's a big difference between conceivable and nearly certain, or what, let's say, the more modern people would say, 50% chance. It's kind of like nowadays the fashionable view, like 50% chance that we collapse. No. Nobody says, I, I've never read people putting statistics on that, but, 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 um, yeah. <laughs> before the collapse thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, it was a pleasure to be here <laughs> Level on how they show up, but it's interesting.